Greetings friends, my name is Lucas Mann and uh, I'm the pastor of the Spring Church here in Lawrence, just out on 221 near the hot spot. And friends, I come out here this afternoon for the express purpose of preaching to you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace, to exalt the, the saving, sovereign grace of God that He gives sinners to warn you about the wrath of God which is to come, which shall befall the wicked. But to say that God has sent His Son into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost. That Jesus Christ has the power to save. And He Himself said that the one who comes to Him, He will by no means cast out. For whoever humbles themselves will be exalted. And those who exalt themselves will be humbled. For God is opposed to the proud, but He gives grace to those who are humble, to those who see their sin, who know they've sinned against God, and who, who embrace that reality. But not just that, but they embrace the truth of the gospel of grace to save them from both the power of sin and the effect of it in their lives. Dear friends, I come out here because I care for souls I care for you where you're going to go when you die. Where you're going to eternally reside. I care. I truly do not want you to die in your sins, to perish in hell for your sins. But I desire that you be received into heaven. All because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ, the King of glory. The text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to this afternoon, that I would like to bring to your minds, is Romans chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. And the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, wrote these words. He said, For all who have sinned against, uh, excuse me, for of all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. This text speaks to the fact that God's law is the means by which He judges the world. It is His standard of judgment that He uses to discern the state of the wicked. God's law is the standard of righteousness by which you will be judged. Or you could say that you have been judged already if you have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. It is God's standard of judgment upon the world. Because God's law, as we're going to see later on, is a reflection of His most holy character. It is a perfect representation of who He is and the righteous character that He possesses inherently. Also, this text speaks to the fact that it is not those who are the hearers of the law. God bless you, ma'am. But it is those who do the law. It is those who obey the law of God. And as we're going to see in a moment, the problem is, our issue, our dilemma, is that we ourselves cannot keep the law of God. No matter how hard we try, we find ourselves having transgressed His holy commands. Truly, the law of God is perfect and pure and righteous. And there is nothing wrong with the law of God. Though when we look at it, we see our sin. It's not that the law of God actually procured sin or caused sin to come about in us, but the law is simply a mirror that shows us our sin. It shows us our guilt before God and our sinful state, our sinful character in light of the perfect character of God. In fact, in Psalm 19, the psalmist wrote in verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. 
The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Truly there is nothing wrong inherently with God's law, but it is without flaw, and that therefore reveals to us our flaws and our sin, our utter imperfection, and ultimately our hatred of God that we have by default because of our sinful state before God. And ultimately, we're going to see a little later on that even though this law does condemn us, and even though we find ourselves condemned to hell, God in His love and in His mercy sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to save sinners. Into the, He came into the world to save vile wretches like you and me. He came to die and to rise again and to intercede on behalf of transgressors. And so God will pardon the sinner on account of the finished work of Jesus Christ, which is the good news, which is the gospel of grace, the gospel of eternal salvation. But before we look at the text and ultimately consider these truths that I just quickly and briefly overlooked or overviewed, I want to consider the context of this passage here in Romans chapter 2 for just a brief moment. I want to consider what surrounds this text here in Romans 2. And here in Romans 2, Paul is simply pointing out the error of the religious. See, in Paul's day, the Jewish people, many for the most part, rejected the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And they were self-righteous and proud. They thought themselves to be good enough to make it to heaven by their own performance by their own religious deeds. And time and time again in the ministry of Jesus and in the, in the ministry of the apostles, they called them out for their hypocrisy and showed them that they had sinned against God and they needed eternal life through the grace of Jesus Christ. But nonetheless, they continued in their hard-heartedness to reject the gospel of grace. And that is exactly the crowd with whom Paul is dealing here in Romans 2. But it not only applies to them, but to all religious people who think themselves to be good enough to make it to heaven by their own deeds. Such people are in a terrible state, for they are self-deceived. Jesus Himself said in Matthew 7 that there will be many on the day of judgment who will say to Him, Lord, Lord! And they will point to all of the various religious deeds that they performed in their life as their means of salvation. And Jesus says that on that day of judgment, He will say to them, Depart from me, for I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. Truly they are in a terrifying state before God. Truly is the religious in a scary spot because they think themselves to be righteous. Such people are most to be pitied and are in desperate need of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And so Paul points the finger to them and calls them out in their sin. That's why in verse 1 of chapter 2 he says, Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, practice the same things. And then he goes on in the next few verses and explains God's judgment upon the wicked. And he concludes in verse 11 by saying, There is no partiality with God. When God deals with the wicked, there is no partiality. He's perfect in His dealings. Perfect in His judgment. Perfect in all His ways. In fact, the psalmist said in Psalm 119, 107, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. God's judgments are flawless. And that leads us to verse 12 and verse 13 that I just read a few moments ago which speak to the fact that in God's impartial judgment He consults His law. He uses His law as the basis, as the standard of judgment upon the wicked which is, as I said earlier, a reflection of His character and so it is in perfect agreement with who He is intrinsically. God bless you, ma'am. And so let us consider those truths as we look at these two verses. He says in verse 12, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. Now this text is not saying that if you've never heard of the law of God, that you will perish and go to heaven. 
Because he says in verse 14, just two verses later, he says, For when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinct instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law unto themselves. In that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. What he is saying here is that even if you have never heard of the Lord Jesus Christ, even if you have never heard of the gospel, heard of the word of God, you still are guilty if you've sinned against God. You still are guilty before God because God has given you a conscience. All people know the God of glory. They know who He is. They know right from wrong. People know it is wrong to lie and wrong to steal, wrong to murder. You don't have to teach people these things. They know that they're wrong, and yet what do they do? They do them anyways. They bring upon themselves guilt anyways for their sin against God. And so this text is not to say, or else Paul would contradict himself within two verses, which he certainly did not. This passage here is not saying that if you've never heard of Christ, then you are completely without blame. You certainly are, because no matter who you are, where you're from, you are sinners. I am a sinner, and I deserve hell for my sin. Sin is a universal thing. It affects all people. He continues, he says, And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. And that is what I want to specifically pay attention to in this passage. Because this carries very, very incredible meaning. That this reveals to us what God's standard of judgment is. See, here on earth, my friends, if someone is to murder someone else, or if a man was to rape a woman, and he is to be judged in a court of law, what law will they judge that man according to if it is in the state of South Carolina? South Carolina law. He will be judged and found guilty according to the law. And no one contends this. No one disagrees when someone judges, when someone is judged according to the law of the land. In fact, we rejoice knowing that justice has been served. We rejoice knowing that there are men and women who sit on tribunals and condemn people to prison, sometimes for a lifetime if they have committed so great a crime that it necessitates such a punishment. And so too it is with God, dear friends, that when God judges the wicked according to His holy law, it is not in any way bad, it is not in any way improper, but it is perfect. It is glorious that God judges the wicked, that God is just in doing so according to His law. And the law that is spoken of here specifically Namely, is the Ten Commandments. It is God's moral standard. It is God's moral law. The law which He gave at Sinai on the two tablets of stone. Those Ten Commandments which you probably are familiar with here being in the South, that is God's standard of judgment upon the wicked. Verse 13, He says, For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, my friends, it does not matter whether you sit in church week after week. It does not matter whether someone even is, a, is someone who holds a high position in a church and they hear the Word of God preached week in and week out. That will not justify them. That will not save them. They need perfect righteousness to stand before God. Jesus Himself said in Matthew 5 to His disciples, He said, you must be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. That is the standard before God. Utter perfection. Total perfection before God. And then the second part of the verse says, but the doers of the law will be justified. That is what someone must do to enter heaven. They must obey the law of God perfectly, live in absolute submission to the will of God that has been written down in Holy Scripture. They must obey perfectly, pray perfectly, read the Word perfectly. But our issue, our problem is, is that we cannot do that. Is that we ourselves cannot do that. God bless you, ma'am. We cannot perform as God demands. We cannot be perfect as God demands of us. Friends, 
this is a scary place to be in. Imperfect sinners standing before a perfect God. Vile wretches standing before the Holy One of Israel. This is a scary place to be in indeed. Why would Paul make mention of this here so early in the book of Romans? It is because one must understand the bad news before they can understand the good news of Jesus Christ. See, my friends, you must come to understand your sin before God and what you deserve for your sin and the holiness of God before you can see the grace and mercy of God as it is revealed in Jesus Christ. You must... The bad news become, comes before the good news. And so that's why Paul says here, okay, if you want to be justified, do the law. Obey the law of God perfectly. Something that we ourselves cannot do. We cannot even get close to doing. But we ask ourselves, why has God given us this law if He Himself knew that we would break it. Well, there's a few reasons that God gave His law. But firstly, it is because He is a just God. Two verses back, He says in verse 11, there is no partiality with God. And then in verse 6, back even further, He says concerning God, who will render to each person according to His deeds. Verse 5, He says, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. God gave His law because He is holy and He is a just God. He is set apart from all that is perverse and all that is evil and all that is wicked. Perfect in all His ways. Indeed, righteous is the Lord and upright are all His judgments on the earth. In fact, we know from the book of Genesis that God is the judge of all the earth, all people, without exception. God is also gracious and compassionate. He is abounding in loving kindness. As the book of Nahum declares in chapter 1, it says this concerning God in verse 2, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries and reserves wrath for His enemies. So as I said, God is just and holy. And then listen to what it says in verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In a whirlwind and storm is His way, and the clouds are the dust beneath His feet. God is patient and gracious and abounding in loving kindness. That is true. We see God's grace put on display for our eyes to see every day. We see God's mercy every day to us, holding back His just wrath against our sin. We see this, friends. But yet we also understand from Scripture that God is a just and holy God. God is the definition of love. He is what love is. That's why 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. Verse 7, it says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows those who take refuge in Him. This speaks to the love and grace of God. Yet these attributes of God never negate one another. They never stand in contradiction to one another, but they are in perfect agreement. God is not a self-contradicting God, but all His attributes stand as pillars holding up the same roof in beautiful agreement with one another. And God in His holiness 
has given His law, the Ten Commandments, for the children of men to obey. The law that is spoken of here in Romans 2, in verses 12 and 13, is the law by which God judges sinners. And it is that law that God in His holiness has given. And it shows us His holy character. The law of God is there to show us two things primarily. Firstly, it is the character of God. And secondly, it is the character of man in light of the character of God. See, God in His law said things like, You shall not steal. You shall not murder. You shall not worship an idol. You shall not commit adultery. Why did God give these commands, friends? It is because God in Himself and in His character is not a liar, is not a thief, is not an unfaithful God, but a perfect covenant-keeping God. Why did God say you shall not idolize? Because God is a jealous God who deserves all glory and honor and praise. See, these commands reveal to us who our Creator is. The value of Holy Scripture is truly glorious. All that we can know about God is found here in Holy Scripture, both the Old and New Testaments, the 66 books which have been inspired by God, the Holy Spirit, to be written by 40 plus authors over a period of 1600 years on three separate continents and in three separate languages. It is this document, it is the Holy Bible that we find all that we need to know concerning life and godliness and his salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this document we find testimony concerning the law of God. Those are the commands that I just mentioned. Those commands which I, we just considered show us the character of God. Also show us the character of man in light of the character of God. They show us our filth in light of the cleanliness and the purity of Almighty God. For He Himself has said, You shall not commit idolatry. How often, friends, have you worshipped something else before the Lord of hosts? How often have you even created a God in your own mind and heart who suits your own desires and suits your own lusts? I have done this very often in my life before. And therefore, because of our breaking of the command, we have incurred guilt. God Himself also said, you shall not steal. Have you, friends, stolen then you have incurred this guilt upon you. This blemish is upon your account. Have you lied before? Well, the Bible says all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. Friends, friends, consider your sin before God so that you can see the Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of glory. Jesus Christ saves to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him. But as I was saying, or have you ever committed adultery? You say, no. Well, Jesus said in Matthew 5, if you look at a woman with lust for her, you have already committed adultery with her in, his, in your heart. Or for you women, the same thing, you with men. God sees you as committing adultery in the heart. Friends, God sees your internet browsing history. When you delete it, God has an account of it. And He knows the things you set before your eyes. And He takes account of it. And friends, one day you will be judged according to, these, to your sins unless you find saving, uh, a saving grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. Unless you flee to Christ today. You must have remission of sins. And it is only found through the, the, through the work of Jesus Christ. It is only found through Jesus Christ and for Jesus Christ and for His glory. here in this place of having broken the law of God, having brought upon ourselves condemnation for our sin and the punishment for our sin, the just penalty for our transgressions is eternal hellfire. Jesus said it is a place of weeping and of gnashing of teeth. He said it is a place of outer darkness. Hell is not a place that you want to go, friends. It is a place of great agony for the wicked. It is a place of torment, of eternal punishment for sin. It is a place where God's wrath against the wicked is unleashed. 
And we all find ourselves condemned there without any hope. Without any hope in and of ourselves. For no amount of good deeds can remove the unrighteous things which we have done. No amount of righteous performance can remove our guilt. No matter how good we think ourselves to be, our guilt is still there before God. And so therefore, we are hopeless. Hopeless. However, as Galatians 4.4 tells us, that when the fullness of the times came, God sent forth His Son. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. Sin kills. Jesus saves from sin. And Jesus Christ came to fulfill that law that we broke. The law of God that we, that we transgressed and that we trampled underfoot. Jesus Christ came and fulfilled it to the uttermost. He lived in perfect submission to the will of the Father in His perfect life. He said in Matthew 5.17 that He came to fulfill the law. And then... To speak of the peak of His humiliation, He laid Himself down as the Lamb of God upon that cross of Calvary. He was beat and spat upon and made a mockery. Humiliated in public and nailed to the cross and satisfied the wrath of the Father in His perfect life and in His perfect death on that cross. His perfect life being poured out for our sin. Excuse me. In His death on the cross, Jesus Christ satisfied the wrath of God. The wrath of the Father was unleashed upon Him. It was unleashed upon Him so that sinners could be pardoned for their sin. That sinners could be forgiven of their transgressions. So that sinners could be pardoned from their sin. As Isaiah 53.10 says, It pleased the Lord to crush him. It pleased the Father's wrath to crush his Son whom he loved. It pleased the justice of God to, plead, to, to crush his Son, Jesus Christ. He interceded for transgressors. He took upon Himself the guilt of His people. He bore the wrath of God. And He cried out at the cross to tell us die. That is, it is finished. And truly it was. Truly salvation had been procured. After three days in the tomb, the Father rose Him up from the grave. And He is alive today. Jesus Christ is alive no other religious leader said what Jesus said and did what Jesus did. Muhammad is dead. Buddha is dead. All the popes are dead. But Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ is alive forever. And death has no power over Him. After 40 days of further ministry, He was exalted into celestial glory at the right hand of God on high. And He's seated there in heaven at the right hand of majesty, having completed the work of salvation once for all. And so friends, the message of the Gospel, the proper reaction that you ought to have is you must repent and flee to Christ. You must turn from your sins, turn from your idolatry, turn from your selfishness, and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Acts 16.31, Romans 5, excuse me, Romans 4.5, but to the one who does not work, but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly, His faith is credited as righteousness. Jesus said in Mark 1.15, He said these very words, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. The day is coming when you will stand before God, friends. 150,000 people die every day. Friends, today could be your day. Today could be my day. 
Friends, don't lose your soul. Flee to the Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. Jesus said in Matthew 11, Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. God bless you, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. He says, Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For the poor sinner who repents and believes upon Christ, God will pardon them of all their sin, forgive them on account of the finished work of Jesus Christ, and He will wrap them in the righteousness of His Son. They will be credited with having lived Christ's life because Christ was credited as if He lived theirs. That's the exchange, friends. That's the great exchange of the Gospel. That Jesus Christ takes my filth and takes my sin upon the cross. And in turn, I receive His righteousness as a gift. I am clothed in the garments of the perfect righteousness of the Son of God, so that the Father looks upon me as perfect, though I did nothing, though I lifted not a finger, all because the Son of God toiled and sweated in His perfect life, and in those 30 years accomplished for me eternal salvation. Friends, this is the glorious gospel of grace. The sinner who trusts in Christ will be adopted as a son or daughter of God, as 1 John 3, 1 says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. This is all by grace and all for the glory of God. All out of the free grace of Almighty God and for the glory and praise of God so that God is exalted. Throughout the New Testament, we find doxologies lifted up to God for what He has done in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. One of such of those doxologies is found in, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20. The writer of Hebrews says, Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus Christ our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen and amen. Hear the word of the Lord, friends. You who are lost, O oh, filthy sinners, come to Christ and be cleansed. I was once a filthy sinner, but Christ cleansed me from my sin. Oh, you lost souls, find saving grace in Christ. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Flee, flee to Christ. And you who are religious, you as well, you need salvation. You who attend church, you need saving grace. Flee to Christ as well, you religious hypocrites, and find saving grace in Jesus. For there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. No other name but the name of Jesus Christ. There are no other name except the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Messiah, King. And my brethren, my fellow Christians, who perhaps are hearing these words preached to you this afternoon, I encourage you, brethren, to rest upon Christ once more today, to find joy in the gospel of grace, and to obey the Lord Jesus Christ, to walk in further holiness, and to preach the gospel to your friends and to your family by the grace of God and for the glory of God. Therefore, in conclusion, we have seen here in Romans chapter 2, verse 11, or excuse me, verse 12 and verse 13, that the law of God is God's measure, is God's standard of judgment. And it is those who do the law that are justified. And not just the hearers. And ultimately we've seen how we cannot keep the law. 
We cannot live up to God's perfect standard of righteousness. We are sinners and we deserve hell for our sins. However, Jesus Christ saved sinners. He came into the world to die upon a cross and He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And all who believe in Him will be saved from their sins. All by the free grace of God. Salvation is by grace. By grace, by grace. Don't listen to the Mormons. Don't listen to Jehovah's Witnesses. Don't listen to the Catholics. Salvation's by grace. Free grace. So that God gets all the glory. And that God gets all the praise. And so that God gets all the honor. And so to God be the glory both now and forevermore through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. To Christ be glory forever. Amen. Amen.